Good day. This is week 14 of a 52-week series on what every web administrator needs to know to be successful in this space. My name is Scott Forsyth, and today I want to discuss outbound rules within URL Rewrite. And so if you've been watching the series so far, I've covered URL Rewrite for incoming rules so far. I spent a few weeks discussing URL Rewrite and also the regular expression part of it. So today I want to talk about outbound rules and the benefit that we have, what we can use them for, and how to use them. And I do, do a couple walkthroughs too, actually. So the question, where are outbound rules used? And what you can do with an outbound rule is you can take the page, the content of your page, and actually change it in flight. So let's say you have a situation where you have HTTP references on a particular page, but you want to, it's your secure page, your login page or your payment page, and you want to change every reference to an HTTPS automatically or particular ones. You can actually do that, and it's more useful if you don't have access to changing the code, if you're stuck in a situation. Or another place where it's very handy is if you have one site with multiple domain names and you want to make every domain name appear as if it's in the root without changing all your code, and you can use an outbound rule to do changes of this nature. Very powerful. The other thing we can do is add X headers or headers on the way through that are available for, for tools like Fiddler and Firebug. And I'll show you both of these examples and they'll make more sense here shortly. So let's dive right in and let's look at our first example. Um, I have a page set up and if I go to contosa.com, this is just for a real simple page, but notice the search here. And if I view the source, it's within an A tag and an href, and I'm going to www.google.com. So because I use Microsoft tools a lot, let's send a little bit of traffic to the Bing search engine, and I want to change this in flight. Of course, I own the site. I can do whatever I want. You wouldn't do this if you managed someone else's site without getting their permission, of course. So let's change this in flight. So here's what we do. We would go to the server level. In this case, you could do it at a site level. In fact, actually, maybe we better. Let's do this contos of site level. And we're going to go to URL rewrite. We will add an outbound blank rule. And we're going to change Google to Bing. Now, a precondition says we only need to do this for certain types of pages. So let's add one for just HTML content. That way, we're not doing text files, image files, any other type of file. We just want to do our HTML content. So we can create a new precondition and we're going to call this is HTML and we're going to say add and it defaults nicely for us to the response content type which is what we want and we're going to say if it starts with text HTML like this and we'll say OK. So now it's only going to apply to that type. Now there's two types of matching scope the response, which we're going to do now, and then the next demo I'm going to do in a few minutes, which is our server variable. And so we're going to match the content within, and there's a bunch that are pre-selected for us. We're going to select our A href, but you could actually use any of the existing ones or even create a custom tag. So there's a lot of flexibility that you have here. And we're going to say if it matches, what we're going to do is let's say if it's anything dot Google and in dot com, I'm doing a slash dot because it's a special character. Dot wildcard. Okay, so now we have anything.google.com. Now see this first, we're going to use that as a back reference one and a back reference two. And so in this situation, we're going to rewrite two. And let's maintain that first part. So it's actually going to be back reference one, but we're going to change it to bing.com to back reference two. And so that way it's going to have the HTTP, and then in my example, didn't have anything after Google.com, but it could be a long URL. It will retain that and only swap out this particular part. So let's apply, and let's see if it works. Refresh, and it doesn't. And I wanted to show you this, is there is a gotcha, is because the page is compressed, it's not able to do that rewrite on the way through. And so there's two ways around this. One, in my case, it's not a busy site. I'm going to turn this off, and that will take care of it. And it's fine for me. Uh, if you do search for that error, you'll get a good result here pretty soon that uh, Ruslan from Microsoft has responded with a solution on how to take care of this. Uh, static compression is not possible, unfortunately, with outbound rewriting. 
uh, but you can do it with dynamic if you have access to the server, if it's not a shared server for you. There's a registry change, one change in app post config, and then reordering the modules. And so if, if you want to do that, it's definitely worthwhile doing that. In my case, I'm just going to turn that off and refresh and notice it works. Let's try it out. Click search, and there we go. It redirected us to Bing. So if I view the page source, notice it really, it changed the content of the page in flight. So you can probably already start to think of many examples where you may want to do this. So that's the first type of outbound rule. Now I want to show an example of how we can use the other type of outbound rule to change the server variables so we can use things like Fiddler to take a look at our X headers. And let's take a look at this. Fiddler is a great tool. If you haven't used it, it's free. It's uh, real straightforward in its use. And the idea is I have it just turned on and it's listening to all traffic going by. If I rep refresh this page, notice that the page request to contosa.com, to the URL slash, is actually recorded. We have lots of information here. If we click on the Inspectors tab and we go to our raw information, we can see a bunch of things. One, the incoming request, and then the outgoing request. Here's the actual response that's here. And you can see also that the browser makes a request looking for the fav icon, or fav icon, to see if it's available there. So it can bookmark that for you. And in this case, there's also some header information that's very useful. You see us at 200 status code. We see the cache control, content length. This information is provided back from the web server. In addition to that, IIS actually provides information on which web server it is and adds in ASP.NET, adds in a couple of headers that are added by default. Those can be removed if you want, but this is here, and also the date. So in our case, let's add an additional X header with some additional information here. And let's go and create a new rule. And, okay, I guess this time I'm doing it at the global level. That's why we don't see the other rule. And so we're going to say add x server name. Now we don't want a precondition. I want to do it for every type of file. And we're going to now change the matching scope to a server variable. Now the variable name, here's the gotcha. And it's not obvious at first what this should be. It needs to start with a response underscore and then every time where you normally have a dash, you'd use an underscore. So for example, this server name here would actually be, it will actually turn into this one here, x server name. Okay, gotcha. So that's not obvious at first at all. But Okay, so the pattern, we don't care. We're going to say anything. And we're, gonna, we're not going to worry about a condition. It doesn't matter. We're going to do it for everything. And the rewrite, we're going to say, your domain name is, and this is just an example, HTTP host. So let's save this and see if it works. So we'll come back here, refresh the page, and we go to Fiddler. Okay, that didn't refresh properly. Let's try again, F5. Go back to Fiddler, and notice that we now have our X server name. Your domain name is contosa.com. So with URL rewrite, we have tremendous amount of control of headers, of the content, of the URL, anything in the server variables. Okay, now I want to take this one step further and I want to show the server name on the way through. This is great for a web farm situation where if I have multiple nodes in a web farm, I want to have each node announce itself on the way through. So if there are failures, I can actually narrow it down to which server is causing that failure. Unfortunately, URL rewrite doesn't provide the server name for us. It's not a standard server variable. And so I made available another tool today that gives us that functionality. And so if I go to my blog and I'm going to search for server name and go to this one here, the URL rewrite server name variable provider. And I have some information about it. And okay, so there are a couple caveats that are really important to take note of. Um, one, this only works for version 2.0 or greater of the framework. And so if you have any with 1.1, it will break them. And so you either want to apply it to just the sites that have 2.0, or if you don't have an old 1.1 site, then no big deal. You can apply it at the global level. 
So this does fail closed, unfortunately, which means if it breaks, it's going to really affect your site because it's taking every outgoing page request and changing it. So just be careful. It shouldn't degrade over time. It's either going to work or not when you first install it, and as long as it works, it should stay working. Uh, but what that means, and also there could be a very small performance overhead because you're adding something on the way through every single time. You may put it on every time, and that's no big deal. It should work completely fine. Or you can turn it on just for troubleshooting. And if you want to troubleshoot a particular site, a particular issue, add this component just when you need it for as long as you need it. Okay, so this blog post also gives an example of what I'm basically covering here right now. So here's how to do the install. Uh, I think it's actually very straightforward. So we're going to go, we download this, and you can extract. In this case, I can just run this directly. And I'll just run the install, dot bat. And basically all that did is added it to the GAC, installed it in a local fo folder on disk, and then it registered the provider in IIS, but it didn't create any rules. So this is safe. It doesn't hurt anything. It didn't do anything destructive on the server at all. So now at the global level, if I go back in to our URL rewrite rule, and I go to the view, view providers, notice that we now have a server name variable that was registered. And so basically the installer added this. So now, with this added to the machine, we can use it. And in here, where we normally put something like HTTP host, we can actually say server name variable, and then a colon is necessary because of the reference to the provider. And so now we have our server name here. So we apply and go to contosa.com again. And now, if we go to Fiddler, notice that the server name is actually provided. So we're able to extend URL rewrite to provide the server name. Great for a web farm situation. So quickly to recap, today we looked at outbound rules in URL rewrite, and we looked at two different styles of rule. One is the response that allows you to change the content of the page in flight, and the other is a server variable that allows us to add an X header or a type of HTTP header to the request on the way through. Hope you found this useful. Thanks again for listening and hope to see you again next week.